Hey, yep. Right, when I first heard about the Royal Enfield Meteor, which has got to be, what, a couple of years ago now, like a lot of people, I envisioned a sort of a classic roadster, probably using the 650 engine, along the lines of the bullet, just like the original Meteor. Then, about eight months ago, when it was finally unveiled, I remember being really disappointed. For a start, it's a 350 single, which doesn't have an awful lot of relevance here in the UK. It's not a very popular segment of the market, in part due to our learner and licensing laws. And secondly, when I first clapped eyes on it, what I saw was a mid-1980s Harley 883 Sportster clone. Well, maybe not a clone, but something along those lines. For me, the mid-1980s was a bit of a non-entity where motorcycle design was concerned. The classic Japanese muscle bikes were all getting long in the tooth, and the big Japanese manufacturers were replacing them with race replicas now known as sports bikes. So a choice became a bit limited. Then Harley-Davidson in the mid-80s brought out the 883 Sportster. Inspired by the American custom scene of the late 1960s and the 1970s, the Harley 883 was a sort of a factory custom. Nothing too extreme and easily affordable. In fact, I do vaguely remember considering getting one, but the bike had what we call character. It was plagued with quality control issues and reliability problems, so I bought a Suzuki GS850 instead and ran that for a few years. Now, Japanese manufacturers like Suzuki and Honda were quick to pick up on the popularity of this sort of genre of motorcycle and very quickly brought out their own versions of this style of bike. A segment of the market now known as the Cruiser, which I'll be honest, for me, is a big turn-off. And so I categorised it in my mind as an irrelevant non-starter and just moved on. But in the last six months, have had hundreds of requests for a review on the Meteor 350. Initially just from Indian viewers, but more recently from guys in the UK, and I thought, what's going on? Well, actually there's two things that are going on. One is that small to medium displacement bikes here in the UK are becoming more popular. Motorcyclists from all walks of life are realising that you don't have to take out a mortgage to be able to afford a motorcycle. And so they're choosing not to. I've been paying attention and there are more small to mid-sized capacity motorcycles on the road than I have ever seen in my 40-something years of riding bikes. And then there's the changing demographics. Guys of my age want to ride the kind of bikes that we coveted as youngsters. And that mindset still exists, but the demographics are younger. For people in the mid-twenties to their early forties, the Cruiser was the bike they coveted as kids. Except this is a more universal attraction because these type of bikes were popular in India were and are also popular in mainland Europe. So actually, the Meteor ticks a lot of boxes. And when you actually take a proper look at it, rather than it being an American-style cruiser clone, Royal Enfield have actually pitched it as a homage to some of their bullet derived models of the past. So it's not really a Harley copy, it's a Lightning copy or a Thunderbird copy. A true part of Royal Enfield's motorcycle culture. And with that in mind, I started to look at it with fresh eyes. As soon as you swing your leg over the Meteor, the first thing that hits you is the comfortable seating position. You sat bolt upright, which is fine at low speeds, and this is not a fast bike. The foot position is a few inches forward of a standard roadster, but it actually feels very natural and intuitive. It's not an extreme leg stretch. I've got fairly short legs with a long body, and I found that my knees were bent and not outstretched. The handlebars are a little little bit higher than I'm used to with, say, the bullet, but they're also closer 
So, once again, your arms are in a very natural, slightly bent position. You're not stretching forward for the bars. The whole thing feels very neutral and natural. There's nothing extreme about this bike at all. Which is exactly what the doctor ordered for an easy, uncomplicated, relaxing ride. The heel-to-toe gear shifter took a little bit of getting used to. These things are nothing new. They were quite common on low capacity bikes 30, 40 years ago. It's just, you know, I've not encountered one for a long time. But you soon get the knack, and it, to be honest, it's no hardship. Royal Enfield gearboxes are usually very good, and this is the best one I've come across so far. I wasn't hurrying the bike because it only had 40 miles on it when I actually took it out. So out of respect for the bike and for Hitchcock's motorcycles, I was gentle and I didn't hurry the bike. But I did find the 5-speed gearbox to be very slick and precise. I'd even go so far as to say it flawless. Now, for a 350 of this type, it did cross my mind while I was riding it that it perhaps had one gear too many with a 5-speed box. The closer ratios between gear changes, I found personally that I was changing gear a little more regularly than I would have liked to on a lazy bike like this. I'm presuming they've included a 5-speed box due to customer expectations. But personally, for this type of bike, a lazy, easy rider, an appropriately spaced four-speed box might have worked out a little bit better. I know it's not an immensely powerful bike at around about 20 horsepower, with a similar torque figure at 4,000 revs per minute, but power delivery is pretty linear. There's no hot spots, so there's really no need for so many gears. That's just my opinion. Now, for a single cylinder motorcycle, a 350 is sort of the sweet spot. From there on in, the larger the capacity, the larger the piston and the more vibration. Add to this a balancer shaft and what you have is a pretty sweet motor. It's responsive, it doesn't feel underpowered, and it's very, very smooth, with a slight sort of V-twin feedback through the chassis. I'm not sure if that's just a happy coincidence or whether Royal Enfield have purposely made it feel that way, but it does give the pleasant sensation, along with the design of the bike, that you're actually riding something bigger and more powerful than you actually are, which has got to be a good thing for any motorcyclist's soul. Whilst running this channel over the last five years, one of the biggest complaints, one of the biggest gripes I hear from viewers is the snatchy, unpredictable throttle response from modern fuel-injected bikes. Mapping that turns your throttle into an unpredictable on-off switch that's problematic when you're setting off or negotiating slow turns. For some strange reason, Royal Enfield seem to be able to sort this problem out where no one else can. The 650 Twins are smooth and predictable, with no nasty surprises where other bikes would prove challenging, and the Meteor is exactly the same. Drama-free and pleasantly predictable. The b brake brakes work well, there's plenty of stopping power, more than sufficient for a bike of this type. Nothing to shout home about, but then again, nothing to complain about. The suspension is on the soft side of plush, arguably exactly how it should be for this kind of bike. Now, I've no doubt that on challenging road surfaces through the twists and turns, the suspension is on occasions going to get a bit confused. Something that I'm sure the aftermarket will take care of. But if this bike is ridden as it was meant to be ridden, long term I can't really see it being an issue. At the end of the day, you don't bite into an apple and expect it to taste like an orange. But putting the suspension to one side for a moment, in the handling department, this bike actually acquits itself very well. You can choose your lines with confidence and the bike will go exactly where intended. The Seat tyres give good feedback and they stick the bike to the road really well. I'm not really sure what more you could want from a bike like this. It's a capable bike that in my mind can turn its hand to just about anything. Commuting, touring, or just a pleasant and very stylish run to the shops. 
I'm not entirely sure how many of these bikes Royal Enfield UK have sold so far, but they did tell me that they have between six and 700 of these bikes on back order with customers' names already on them. And that's just for the UK. I think this proves what I've suspected for quite some time. Royal Enfield are very good at identifying untapped markets. Instead of running with and just trying to compete with the herd, they carve out their own niche which opens up the floodgates on sales. They don't seem to be able to put a foot wrong at the moment. As diminutive as 350ccs might seem to us in the UK, and probably to the guys in the States, it is, as I have learned, a very underestimated sector of motorcycling. This is a capable bike that will be able to keep up with modern traffic in most situations. It's going to be relatively cheap on insurance and your road fund license as well. It's very well specced, and I'll get into that in a moment. And it's selling for practically moped money. I do find it difficult to get my head around the low price for what you're actually getting. A lot of reviewers have categorised this as a ladies bike or a beginners bike but I think that's a bit short sighted. This category of bike is very popular in Asia, it's also popular in the Mediterranean countries and rather than try to categorise who it's going to appeal to, I think it's sufficient to say that this bike is going to appeal to a lot of intelligent personalities irrespective of the gender or their experience as motorcyclists. The international bike market is changing and it's changing in this direction. Passed a comment in a previous video that with each new model Royal Enfield seemed to be upping the quality stakes. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being awful and 10 being excellent, the bullet models scored about a 5. I've got no personal experience of the Himalayan but certainly where the Interceptor and the Continental GT650 were concerned, that jumped to a solid 7, 7.5. And having run my eye critically over the Meteor, I would give it a very definite 8.5, maybe a 9. Which is quite astounding for a model with a top trim level coming in at under £4,000. The paintwork on the frame and the plastic parts has been top notch for some time. But where Royal Enfield fell down was on the metalwork often having a very uneven paint finish with very clear and pronounced orange peel effect. Close inspection of the three meteors that Hitchcock's had on site, as well as some of the Euro 5 interceptors, demonstrates to me that Royal Enfield have now sorted this out. The paint finish is even and now almost glass smooth. They've also streamlined the chain adjustment system which is now much tidier and simpler and everywhere you look on these bikes you are looking at top quality. There is some room for improvement but they're almost there. Royal Enfield have decided to go with a sort of double duplex frame at the front which does still use the engine as a stressed member, with the rear subframe echoing their earlier bikes, the Bullet and of course the original Meteor. Indicators and lights in general look more premium and they are utilising LEDs where they can. They've also dispensed with the usual bent tubular grab rails for something a little bit more upmarket, with some very stylish cast aluminium items. They've also opted for cast aluminium wheels which I've no doubt will have kept the price down but will also keep a lot of prospective customers happy. But the type of finish on these wheels does vary with the trim level that you choose. With a steel rear mudguard and a plastic front mudguard the whole bike has a very premium look and feel to it. They've even taken the trouble to decoratively grind back the cooling fins. 
Royal Enfield are definitely catching the competition up. The Meteor has been awarded with all new switch gear, which is very reminiscent of some Honda items from the dim and distant past. Build quality is good, it's about the same as the previous iteration that they've been using, but it does have a more premium look to it. Even the levers look more premium and are better finished than most modern classic motorcycles offered for sale on the market today. The instrument panel is very high tech, not just for a Royal Enfield. A mixture of conventional analog and LCD in the main pod gives you readouts for the fuel gauge, gear position indicator, including an economy prompter. Instead of one indicator reminder, it now has two, so you can see which one is actually flashing. And of course, we have the Tripper sat-nav system. It's all pretty cool and useful by modern standards. Back in the 1980s, I would have given my left testicle for something like this. And this bike even has a hazard warning indicator system. You quite honestly couldn't ask for any more at this price point. Now, it was a six hour round trip for me to visit Hitchcock's motorcycles and I was trying to make the best of the time I had available because we did have other filming projects planned. So I didn't get to spend as much time with the Meteor as I would have liked to and it's perhaps something I can revisit in the future. I would like to say a big thank you to Dan at Hitchcock's for indulging me and keep an eye open for a complete shop tour coming up in the near future. Now, once again, thank you so much for watching this and my other videos. I really do appreciate it. I do hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please leave a like. And if you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to this channel. Now, if you do subscribe, please hit the notification bell and ensure that your notifications are enabled. That way you will be informed whenever I upload a new video. I will be back on Friday, so until then, please ride safely, and I'll see you soon.